it's on. Now Nick can do his thing. So it's good to be back today. Um, we are following up. We're in a sermon series on hope. And so last week, we had a really, really important conversation about hopelessness. And we talked about, and I even talked about, how I felt hopeless over the last 20 months and how that's kind of been a common experience for a lot of people. And we looked at Ezra and we looked at the rebuilding of the temple because in a lot of ways, we can identify with the Jews, right? The, God, the, the house of worship, all of those kind of things kind of went away. And then they're kind of coming back, and there's some rebuilding to be done. And the, the work didn't completely stop over the last 20 months. Uh, we had some folks that were very faithful in that time, but uh, it, things were very different than Scripture kind of guides us to, and things were very different than we're used to. And so for a lot of people, that kind of produced a hopeless feeling. And so we're talking, now that things are different, better, about hope and how we can find hope to kind of come out of that darkness. So I'm really excited about this. That's not what I expected. Uh, something's, my forward is going backward. I don't know why, but I might can adjust in my head. Okay, do we want to try it again? Okay, now we're, now we're good. So this man is thinking, it's not somebody you should know, it's just one of those stock photos uh, but I want to talk for a minute about depression and hopelessness and thinking. So one of the things that in the counseling office, that kind of one goal I have, kind of an initial goal I always want to work, is if I can change the way a person thinks, then I can start to change the way they feel and the way that they behave. So if I can start to influence a person's internal dialogue, if I can shift their perspective, then they can be happier and healthier. Now, changing thinking isn't, isn't always completely curative, but it's usually, at the very least, the first step. And so as I think about how, as a church, we can be kind of hopeless, and how, as individuals who are Christians, we can be kind of hopeless, I want to continue this series after identifying that God's not mad at us because we're hopeless, God wants to encourage us. I kind of want to identify a common way of thinking that often gets us in trouble. So here's a little kid sitting on the couch, and this is my representation of cowering. So we're going to talk about cowering this morning. You know, kind of the idea that uh, life is scary, maybe something frightened this kid. In my imagination, it's, there's a thunderstorm outside, and he's hiding under the pillows to protect himself from the storm. I had a dog growing up, Sheriff. He was about this big. He was a little miniature schnauzer, but I had a big, tough name, Sheriff. And whenever it would thunder, he would run under my bed and hide. That's cowering, right? So sometimes if we're thinking about the way we think, I think that a lot of Christians have an attitude of cowering. We kind of tend to run and hide when things get hard. Now that's not a biblical attitude, but it is a common attitude. So one my attitude that might lead to hopelessness is this idea of cowering. You can contrast that with the idea of conquering. You see the two C's, that's a little wordplay. As Christians, we can either cower or we can conquer, and there's really not a lot of room in between. And so we have this big, strong suit of armor that represents conquest. And Samuel read that verse for us from Romans chapter 8, that in all these things we are more than conquerors. So we have these two opposing attitudes, right? We can cower or we can conquer. So my question for you today is, we're going to do a little bit of an assessment this morning, and then we're going to tie it to hope, because a lot of the times we don't have hope because of the mindset we take. Do you have a mindset of cowering, hiding in the corner, being scared, running around, ducking, trying to get by without getting hurt, or do you have an idea of conquering? Because those two things are very, very different. A conquering mindset says that the kingdom of God is coming into this world as it is in heaven, and I'm a part of that. A cowering mindset says, you know what, I just got to keep my head down and not get hurt so that I can go to heaven when I die. I don't, I don't want to get messed up. I got to survive. I got to lay low. I got to duck and hide. And a lot of the times we're taking the wrong attitude as Christians. So we're going to do an attitude assessment this morning, but... Before we do that, I want to teach or remind, because it's going to be different for everybody, of some really important biblical truth. So this is not a sermon 
that looks like my other sermons, even though I'm saying that a lot lately, so maybe I've lost my way. Uh, but I want to give you a little bit of teaching this morning uh, before we get to the application. So we as Christians, we like know that Christianity is like the outgrowth of Judaism. We know that we have like Jewish roots, but we don't like really understand Jewish roots very well. And I don't really like this slide. That was an error on my part to do the sky background and the, the black letters. But I really want to read this Daniel 2 prophecy to you. Now, this is... Daniel's been sent into exile. We talked about them coming back from exile last week and rebuilding the temple. Uh, but Daniel is in exile. He works in the court of Nebuchadnezzar, and he's kind of been kidnapped, and they attempted to brainwash him and reprogram him, uh, but Daniel stays faithful to God. And so in Daniel chapter 2, while Daniel's in exile, and he's a, a part of this group of, of Jewish exiles, made up, and he's a part of exiles from all over the Babylonian Empire, it seems, uh, he just happens to be Jewish and the others are different. Uh, they're kind of in a re-education camp. We read, thank you, Nick, you made that a lot better. We read this prophecy. God sends Nebuchadnezzar a dream. And in that dream, he sees this statue. And the statue's made of different parts. And it's got a gold head and it, it's got different body parts made of different things. And he can't figure out this dream. He knows it's prophecy. He keeps getting it over and over again. And so his wise man Wise men can't solve it. They're about to execute them all. And Daniel's like, hold on. Like, I can't interpret this, but I serve a God in heaven who can. Give me an audience with the king, and I will tell the king his dream and what it means. And so Daniel goes before the king, and, and basically this prophecy that Nebuchadnezzar had is world history. And he talks about the Babylonians and how that empire will fall, and they'll be replaced by another empire and the Jews of Jesus' day had correctly interpreted this as the Babylonians and then the other ones. And then that last empire in this prophecy, they identified as Rome. Now, the part that gets really interesting is this prophecy hundreds of years before with Daniel doesn't explicitly mention the Romans, but the Jews interpreted it as being the Romans. And this is what that prophecy says. And in those days, the kings... And in the day of those kings, so in the days of the Roman emperors, that's how any Jew in the first century would interpret this. In the days of the Roman emperors, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor shall that kingdom be left to another people. It shall break into pieces all of the kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. So if you're a good Jew, if you're a Pharisee, if you're religious, you are looking for a Messiah that is going to come and he's going to bring about a kingdom that will never be destroyed, a kingdom that won't be given to another people, meaning it won't be conquered, it won't be given away, it won't be inherited by someone else, but it will destroy the kingdoms of this world and it will stand forever. That's what the Jews are looking for. Now, they thought that Jesus was going to be a Messiah, just like worldly messiahs. They thought he would be a military figure who would do this with military force. But instead, Jesus came and he claimed to be a Messiah. And all of Jesus' sermons had this messianic kingdom of God principle. Jesus preached, Matthew 4, 17, his ministry, his Galilean preaching ministry is summarized in verse 17 of Matthew chapter 4 when he says, repent for the kingdom of God is coming. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand, the ESV says. And then from there, he says, Matthew 6, verse 10, he teaches his disciples to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. When he's on trial with Pilate for claiming to be a king, Jesus says, my kingdom isn't like this world because it doesn't fight like this world, but my kingdom is coming into the world from somewhere else. And so Jesus, when he was here, he's feeding off the many... Why do I keep saying that wrong? The messianic expectations of the Jews in his day. And he's saying, look, God's kingdom is here. I'm its king, and it's coming to earth as it is in heaven. And so it's in that background, in that context, Jesus says one thing I want to highlight, and then Paul says something that Samuel's already read about the kingdom. When he's about to leave this earth, and when he's about to leave kind of Peter in charge as the head of the disciples, he says this to Peter. I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. 
And I put in brackets my called out people because that's a good, the people of God, not an institution, but Jesus is talking about an assembly of people. I'm going to build my assembly of people together. And the church is a great way to describe that concept, but I just want to make sure you understand it. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And then he tells Peter, you know, in Acts chapter 2, well, he didn't say it that way, but he says, Peter, you're going to preach this sermon and it's going to open the kingdom of heaven for people to come in. I'll give you the keys of the kingdom. So just focus on that bold part, right? The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And then we have this beautiful Romans 8 passage that you can be more than a conqueror. So I said I was going to teach you something and then we're going to have an attitude assessment. What we really need to learn this morning, and it's from Scripture, I showed you from Scripture, we can talk a lot more about this, but you need to understand Christianity, you need to understand what's happening here, is that the church is supposed to be conquering the world in the name of Jesus. Jesus used kingdom language. There was a reason that Romans and Jews persecuted Christians, because they were making claims that sounded political. They they wouldn't say that Caesar was Lord. They would say that Jesus is Lord, and that's a competing claim, right? Caesar's not king of the whole world. Jesus is king, and Christians, because of that, were willing to go be crucified. They were willing to go be fed to lions because they were conquering the world in the name of Jesus. Now, one day I'm going to re-preach this sermon and we're going to talk about how we conquer being different than the world because Jesus said, my kingdom doesn't conquer like this world. My kingdom doesn't use armies. It uses love and sacrifice. But the important point you need to know today is that the church is the winner. The church is conquering the world in the name of Jesus and nothing is going to change that. I mean, it's right there in Matthew chapter 16, right? The gates of hell will not prevail against it. And we're hopeless because of the situation we find ourselves in in the culture. We're hopeless because numbers are down and Christianity's on the decline and young people don't believe anymore. But Jesus said the gates of hell won't prevail against it. And it might be true that Christianity is declining in America, but Christianity is booming in Central and Latin America. It's booming in Africa. It's booming in India. And we as Christians need to walk around with an attitude of conquest because scripturally that's exactly what we're doing. We are conquering the world in the name of Jesus based on what he's done. And I'm making this sound like our victory, but it's his victory. When we spoke about the cross two years ago, we talked about how Jesus on the cross won the victory. He defeated the powers of the world. So this morning you need to assess your attitude and you need to determine if you are cowering or you're conquering. And I can say, in all honesty, because of what I said last week, if you're visiting, you weren't here for that, and that's okay. But I have, and I think we have done a lot of cowering. We read about that when the Jews cowered last week, right? They were afraid because the surrounding nations were threatening them. But in the cowering, and I'm not shaming us for cowering, but in that cowering, God spoke to them and said, I will be with you, I will strengthen you. And they began to build. And we need to shift our attitude from cowering to conquering. Because that's the scriptural promise. We'll talk more about that, how we do that in a minute. I really want to emphasize what does a cowering attitude look like. Think about that for a moment. What does a Christian who's cowering, how do they live? I think one word you could use to describe it is fear, right? The idea of cowering and and going through life with a cowering posture says, you know what, I'm afraid. What will people think about me? You know, in Acts, we read about the Acts of the Apostles. We read about Paul, and uh, they always spoke boldly, right? Uh, the, The Apostles, when they were arrested, they rejoiced and they prayed for boldness. Sometimes Christians cower, and we say, you know what? If I say something... Something bad might happen to me. We do that, right? We cower. I think a lot of times, too, as Christians, we think, well, you know, this world's getting really bad. And so we cower by excluding ourselves. We kind of go into our little holy huddles. And we say we're protecting our holiness, um, but we're really just shutting ourselves off from the world and we're afraid to interact. I think cowering also looks like people who are 
protective of what they have. You know, you're, we're too busy guarding our bases instead of going out and making gains and making headway for the kingdom of God in this world. So cowering looks like someone who's afraid. But what does conquering look like? I think that's a great question, question as well. What does a Christian who lives with a conquering attitude look like? So I told Emily that I was going to do my best uh, Hulk Hogan and Ric Flair impersonation. Now, growing up, I loved WWF. I was watching some of it this week as sermon prep. And, um, man, that stuff is so cheesy. You know, I thought about just ripping my shirt and tie off, because that's what Hulk Hogan always did, right? He, he would strut in, and uh, what's the song, A Real American? And he would get to the center of the ring and rip his shirt off. Um, that's a conquering attitude. Emily told me that I should put a shirt and tie on over a shirt and tie so that I could rip it off and have another shirt and tie on. Um, and I'm like, you shouldn't encourage my bad behavior. Um, if I wouldn't break the microphone and hurt your ears, you know, I'd get that Ric Flair, woo! Um, but just like a hundred times louder. Is that what a conquering attitude looks like? Well, I mean, maybe if that fits your personality. Now, you don't have to rip your shirt off and woo. That might be a bad idea. But you should have an attitude of confidence. I mean, when those guys walked in, I mean, they highlight 80s and 90s machismo. You know, they are masculine to the definition, past the definition. And when we think about Christians, the attitude that we should have as conquerors, you know, living a life without fear, I think that's a decent representation, not in the absurdity of the practice, but in the confidence that we carry. You know, we talked about Daniel in Daniel chapter 2. Uh, they passed a law that said you can't pray to anybody other than Nebuchadnezzar for uh, 30 days, and Daniel didn't even shut his windows when he went about his daily prayer routine. A cowerer says, you know what, I'm going to close my windows, because that's all Daniel had to do. They set up this law to get Daniel in trouble because they didn't like him, and he would pray every morning in front of his window, and all he had to do was shut the windows and cower a little bit. But he left them open because he was a conqueror. He left those windows open and prayed, and they threw him in the lion's den, and Nebuchadnezzar and the whole country praised God because of it. That's the difference. In a, a, a cowerer shuts the windows, a conqueror leaves them open. Because we have confidence, we have a boldness. I love that Romans 8 passage. I say everything is my favorite, but I really mean it's one of my favorite chapters of Scripture because Paul goes through it and he says, look, in spite of persecution, because Paul and the boys, we think we're persecuted, they were really persecuted. <sighs> through persecutions, through imprisonments, through beatings, through all of these things, life, death, famine, nakedness, sword, we are more than conquerors. Paul says the world can throw everything at us that we can, but through Christ we are conquering. And a conqueror looks like an attitude of triumph, an attitude of confidence, and an attitude that while we may be, as Paul says, earthly vessels in jars of clay, that God is in us, and Ephesians 3 says, the power at work within us can do things than we think or imagine. Living with the confidence of God that he can work through us is an attitude of a conqueror. Now, we've had some fun, and now I want to step on everybody's toes. Because... This is really not personal. And what I mean by that, it's not personal, is that we walk around. What I, I, I want you to be confident. I want you to be bold. I want you to have an attitude that says, I'm a victor, I'm a conqueror. But we are the conquerors. This is about the church. And if you want to have a conquering attitude, you will be a part of the church that conquers. Because... Jesus didn't say, I'm going to raise up thousands of Christians and they're going to conquer the world. He said, I'm going to get my people and my people together will conquer the world. And we could stop right here and we could talk about unity. We could talk about love. We could talk about hope being a, Christianity being a transforming community. But if you want a conquering attitude, you are going to be involved in the conquering body. If the church is the army that's taking over the world, you're not conquering if you're sitting at home all alone. You're not conquering if you refuse to participate. And I'm not saying you can't work, 
worship virtually when it's appropriate. But I'm saying if you're not involved, if you're not working in the body, you don't really have a conquering attitude. Sports teams, they're not going to conquer the world. Work's not going to conquer the world. Civic organizations aren't going to conquer the world. The PTA is not going to conquer the world. The sportsman's club that I just renewed to is not going to conquer the world. The church is going to conquer the world in the name of Christ. And so we need to keep that in mind. That a conquering attitude, yes, looks like confidence, but it also looks like involvement. And if you're wandering around and you feel hopeless and you feel lost, then, you know, you, you're not going to conquer unless you're a part of God's conquering people. And I think that that's really important to say. So I, I've been accused of preaching too long lately, and I'm, I'm guilty. So let's try to wrap this thing up. So this sermon about conquering is in the middle not the middle it's at the beginning with strap yourselves in we're going to be here for a while uh not of the sermon i'm sorry but of the sermon series we're going to talk about hope for a good eight weeks but how does victory affect hope we are at the start of a sermon series about hope and i want to change your perspective to have a victory mindset so that you can have hope and here's the thing is that depression if you want to call it that we can call it that in a different context hopelessness, that's a good Christian context, they all come from that feeling of like there's no way out, there's no way forward. We say hope in the darkness, and if I could go back to that title slide, which I can't, uh, you would see that that hope in the darkness is kind of like in a hole looking at the sky. And that's how hopelessness feels, like you're in a situation where there's no positive way out. Like, no matter what you do, you still lose. That's what it feels like to be hopeless. We're not hopeless if we believe there's a way forward. And if we can change our thinking from this situation is bad to no matter what happens, I win. That's what Paul says in Romans 8. We didn't put it on the screen, but all things work together for the good of those who believe. If we can change the way we think from this situation is hopeless, this is bad, there's no way forward to I can't lose which is the message of Scripture. The kingdom of God is coming. The kingdom of God is going to take over the world. Now, Jesus himself is going to finish that. Revelation talks about that. But if we can change our attitude to be an attitude of victory, if we can strut around like we own the place, then we'll have hope. We won't feel hopeless. Hope is the belief and confidence in God's better future. Because Jesus said the kingdom is coming, The gates of hell will never prevail against it. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. That's all God's book. And if we can believe that, if we can trust it, if we can have confidence in it, then we'll never struggle with hopelessness. As someone who told you last week that I struggled with hopelessness, I am saying that if we can shift our thinking, and maybe this is just a sermon for me, but I think we all need it. If we can shift our thinking, we can be confident in God's better future and we'll have hope. As a result, hope is belief and confident in God's better future. And if we can do that, if we can find that, if we can shift our thinking to that, then we won't struggle with hopelessness. So I'm going to give you some application uh, after our attitude adjustment. But if you can focus on God's victory, you can fuel your hope. If you can focus on victory, you'll have fuel for your hope. So let's do that this morning. So how do we do that? How do we change our mindset? I told you if I can change your thinking, we're well on the right track. How do we change our mindset? Well, first of all, this is a review from last week, but we need to remember God's mercy, God's presence, and God's promise. When you feel hopeless, when the situation feels bad, God's not not mad at you. He doesn't want you to shape up real quickly. He's going to say, I'm coming, I'm bringing mercy, and I'm going to keep my promises to you. So that's really important. This is a review from last week. Number two and number three kind of go hand in hand. We need to work to shift our thinking to a victory mindset. Now, I put three verses on the screen, and I think that they're all really good. You need to write them down. Colossians 3, 1 through 4, Romans 12, 1 through 3, and Philippians 4, uh, verse 4 through 9. Philippians 4 is more about anxiety, and we're talking about anxiety in our Wednesday night class. Uh, We got depression in the Sunday morning and anxiety on Wednesday nights. We're calling them hope and peace, but they go together, trust me. So 
we as Christians, we need to work to shift our thinking to a victory mindset. Three great passages I want to explore Colossians with you. Colossians 3 uh, verse 1 says, If you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things that are above, not on the things of the earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will appear with him in glory. So Paul here is saying, look, if you want to have hope, and this is about hope and it's about good behavior. He's trying to change their behavior by changing their way of thinking. He says, if you want to to change, to be more like Christ, focus on the things of God. Focus on the things that have been revealed from heaven. Set your mind on the things that are above. Set your minds on the victory. When you want to think about something, think about the fact that Christ is going to reappear. The king is going to come back. The king is going to come back in conquest. And when he comes and when he sets the world right, when he comes as a judge, you will be glorified with him. Paul is saying focus on the victory. Find hope in the victory. If you want to change your life, change the way you think by thinking on the victory of God. Think about the upcoming, impending victory of Jesus and the role that you play in it. And if, I see, if my demeanor is different than last week, it's because I've been thinking about this all week. How we should be fired up, how we should be excited. So number one, shift your thinking. Focus on the good things of God. And when something else creeps in, we'll talk about this on Wednesday night, just make the conscious decision to stop thinking about something that's hopeless or anxious and argue against that with the things of God. We'll talk about that when we work through Philippians 4 because that's a really better example. But I didn't want to tip my hand for Wednesday night. I wanted you to come for that. Um, and then the final point, and then I'll let you go home. The easiest way to do this, I think, is to remember past victories. Hebrews 11, we call that the faith chapter. Verse 1 says that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now that's a little lofty and academic for me. Um, but I'll just summarize it by saying this. Faith is believing. Faith is not knowing, but faith is believing because of the experiences that you have. And that's what Hebrews 11, we call it the Hall of Fame of Faith, that it lists all these great people and all these great people that have done things for God because they had faith in God. But really, the reason the Hebrews writer is saying that is because he's saying, build on our collective experience, because he's writing to Jews about Jewish people so that they'll stay faithful to Christ, the Jewish Messiah. And he's saying our collective history as a people points towards the faithfulness of God. And then in chapter 12, which he didn't, or she, didn't write chapters, Uh, the Hebrews writer said, let us, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us set our eyes on Christ, the author and perfecter of our faith, and run the race with endurance. Focus on the things of God, remember the past victories, and let that fuel you forward. So, today, We've got to shift our thinking. We don't want to cower, we want to conquer. And we're not cowerers, I don't know if that's a real word, uh, but, okay, Nick says it is, he knows more about English than I do. Uh, We don't want to be cowerers, we want to be conquerors. And that's a scriptural promise, that you can be more than a conqueror. Now, that's not a health and wealth gospel, that's not, if you just think it, you'll achieve it, that's not, you know, go out in the workforce and make a million dollars next year because God's with you. That's if you're in God's people, God's people are taking over the world in his name, and you can be a part of that. That's a scriptural promise. This new way of thinking that we're conquerors should give us hope. When the situation feels like there's no way forward, like we're in a hole that we can't dig out of, the fact that God has said we're conquerors, God has promised we will conquer, should help us dig out of the hole and find hope. If there's anything we can do for you this morning to help you find hope, we would love to do that. Hope comes from being in the right relationship with God because we know the future is secure. Maybe you need to get in the right relationship with God this morning by hearing the gospel, Romans 10, 17, believing it to be true, Mark 16, 16, repenting of your sins, Luke 13, 3, confessing Jesus as Lord, Matthew 10, verse 32 through 33, and by being baptized. 
uh, in, in baptism, you're put in the body of Christ that's going to be raised to newness of life, Romans 6 says, Colossians 3 as well. If you're here this morning and you need hope, that's found in Jesus and that's found as a part of his church. If we can do anything for you to help you hope, then let us know. One of the ways that you can do that is by coming forward and sitting on the front pew and I'll talk to you and our elders will pray with you and we'll pray for you as a church. Maybe you need to call this week and, and schedule a time to come and talk about how you can work through some of the things in your life that make you feel hopeless. Those are all options. Maybe you need to have a conversation with God uh, after being baptized about how he can help you find hope no matter what you need we're here for you if we can do anything for you in that public way that we talked about why don't you come forward while we stand and sing